privilege to be a God, to know a God that is close to us even when we feel so distant. Lord, I just thank you for who you are this morning. We praise you and we worship you. Amen. I'm going to pray and we're going to get into our series of, on If Jesus, a series that we've been looking at. And I'm going to pray first. Father, we just thank you for your word to us. Thank you how you, uh, even, pray, or even during our prayer time this morning, it was prayed that your words would go out to us and it wouldn't return void. And Lord, I thank you that that is what your word says, that it is a reality that what you speak over us and into us is always effective. It, it is never dampened down or watered down, but it impacts us and changes us and transforms us. And so Holy Spirit, I ask that you take your word this morning and that it will be implanted into our hearts, that it will bear fruit, Lord God, not just for us, but for our community, for the glory of Jesus. Amen. So we're looking at this morning the If Jesus series, and the title for this morning is If Jesus Was a Big Brother. And the big idea that we're looking at this morning is what does it mean to be part of a family? What does it mean to be part of a church family as, as Jesus is our big brother? And, and what does it mean to be part of this family where the inheritance and the, and the life of God is passed down to us so that it's meant to spread out into this world in which we live? Now, depending on our backgrounds, I'm sure we may have positive, negative, in-between experiences about family. And so my heart and uh, prayer this morning morning is that we may begin to see what it means to be part of this incredible family that God has called us to be part of. Miles Hill Church being one expression of it, but this wider family that we are part of as a, as a group of churches across this nation and world. Um, so as we look at this, one of the things I want to look at is what does it mean to, uh, from a biblical standpoint, to be part of a family? And, and family was super important to, well, Israel, to the Jews, to, to the early church, and, the, and there was a big idea of, you know, you were set in these families, you were loved, you, you had a part to play, and that things were passed down and responsibilities were passed down through the different generations. And, and the, uh, the old kind of writings, the Mishnah, these are Jewish writings on, on the Torah, the Old Testament, or the, the, the laws of the Old Testament speak a lot about what it means to have a, have a family inheritance. And a lot of it comes from uh, the book of Numbers. So if you've got your Bible, open up into Numbers 27. And this is one of the key passages that they look at. And in verse 8 it says this, You shall speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall transfer his inheritance to his daughter. And if he has no daughter, then you should give his inheritance to his brothers. And if he has no brothers, then you should give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no inheritance, has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the nearest kinsman of his clan, and he shall pass it, possess it. And it shall be for the people of Israel a statue and rule as the Lord commanded Moses. Now they have this kind of weird way of working in those days, and certainly still runs through the Jewish uh, family line, is that, is that the, 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 you became a Jew or you became that nation of Israel through the mother's line, the matrilineal line. So that if your mum was a Jew, you were a Jew. If your dad was and your mum wasn't, you weren't really considered as a Jew. You could obviously opt in, but, but you weren't. It came through the mother's line, yet the passing down of the inheritance came through the father's line, the patrilineal line. That your inheritance came passed down, so land and clans and, and groups that they lived in was very much linked to the father. So both were important, both mother and father, for your identity as your religious identity, but also your national identity identity which came through your father and the, and the big idea therefore was that both men and women were loved looked after and provided and cared for now there's this misconceived idea that, that people looked down on the women and they raised up the men because the men got the inheritance the women didn't but it wasn't really like that there was provision for both that God, through his law, made sure that both men and women were equally provided for, that they had equal standing and that they desired that, that God's love would be seen and provision would be seen through both man and woman, husband and wife, mother and father. 
And we read there in, in Numbers that, that both male and female could have an inheritance, although it mainly came through the male line. And, and what they also looked for was they looked for the firstborn. There was a, a big principle that the firstborn son had a, a weightier responsibility upon his life and also had privileges because of that. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 21, let's just flick on a book. And you'll see this, Deuteronomy 21, verse 15. If a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possession as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. So, you know, God wants to make sure that the right things are done. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. And so the firstborn son had a, a weightier responsibility and a privilege of a double portion so that he could ensure that his family, his clan, his group, the village that he lived in was well provided for and cared for. So not only did they have a, an inheritance that was double, but they were also so given a kingdom. If you flip over again to the book of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 21. And verse 1 says this, Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers, it means he died, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the son of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jezel, Zechariah, Azariah, Michal, and Shaphatah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver, gold, and valuable possessions, together with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. And so not only did they get a double portion, but they were given this kingdom. They were to look after it, look after its welfare, look out for the needs of those that were poor and oppressed. That they were making to make sure that no one was in any kind of needs. And that, so God's idea of family groups is that we live together in harmony and in love and in provision. And that's the outset of when we think about what does our families look like? Is are they places where we kind of nurture and grow and love one another? Whether that's our, our human families or whether it's our church family. Are there places where we share and we give and we provide and we love? That was God's intention right from the beginning. That that's what it would look like. Both a double portion of an inheritance and a kingdom that would come together to make the needs of the people. And that's the way God wants it to be. And the amazing thing is, is that it doesn't just have to come down through a family line. If we look at the Bible, and I'm going to flick through a few different chapters, so bear with me, you will see that inheritances and blessings and kingdoms, because of the way God is, can come through other means. Sometimes they're just spiritual blessings because of who you are. Even if you were born into a bad family, sometimes God raised people up and provided for them and gave to them so that they could impact that community in which they were living in. So one of the, the key guys is, is this guy called Job. And if you look in the, at the beginning of Job, it, it says this, Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go out and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. You see, we see from the outside that he's this family man. He's caring for his kids. He's caring for his family. He wants to live a life of integrity, uprightness, selflessness. Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan turns up. The Lord says to Satan, from where have you come? Satan goes, well, you know, I've been hanging around, going there, here, there and everywhere around the earth, walking up and down, just checking out the scenery, just seeing who can 
sort out and trip up. And the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. I don't know about you, but when I turn up and chat to God sometimes, I love him to say that about me. Have you considered my servant David? He's an upright man. He shuns evil. He runs away from it. He never gets caught up in the snare of sin. If only, eh? Yeah, this is what God says about Job. That he says he's a man with a God heart, a godly integrity, a man that is upright and just. If you read through the book of Job, you just see the way that he worships God in the midst of his afflictions. You'll see the way that he looks to make provision for the poor and the downtrodden and those that have been exiled and marginalised. He's this man that isn't just consumed by his wealth, which he had much of but was desperate to see his family, his clan, provided for in every way. And, and God, because of that, gives Job, and you see at the end of his days, he gives him a double portion of everything that he ever had, that he's more blessed than he ever has been. And God is looking for people who are faithful with who he is. And you know, I'm not talking about here prosperity and money and wealth. I'm talking about being faithful with the things that God wants to deposit in our lives. You know, there's this idea that, you know, you may not have been born as the firstborn, you may have not born been born the most intelligent, witty, with all the gifts and skills, and yet you are chosen and gifted and called, and that as our hearts are devoted to Him with great love, and as our lives become full of integrity and passion for Him, He will give to us, trust to us, something of His inheritance. And the more in which we can be faithful with what God has given us, the more he can give us. You know, that's what Job speaks to us about. If you look at somebody like Joseph, you know, Joseph wasn't the firstborn. He's right down the end of the line, you know. He wasn't the youngest, but he was close to it. Reuben should have had everything, and yet Joseph is favoured and loved. Why? Because he had a heart that was for God and for his family. He wanted to live in a way that provided for his family to use the gifts that God had given him. And God raises him up and makes him one of the most powerful people in Egypt because of his faithfulness. You see, it's not just about what family we're born into, it's what we're given through our Heavenly Father, and it's about a family that we are born into through his Spirit. What about Esau? What a classic example. A classic example of of God wanting to work in somebody's life and yet he chooses to sell it for a meal. You know, as I talk about this, what I want us to, to grasp here is the things that God has for us, we can miss. You know, there's blessings, there's inheritances, there's callings and there's gifts that God has given each and every one of us this morning. And you may be on this journey of faith, I don't know where you're on it, but God has called you, He knows you, He knows right where you're at. He has a significant plan for your life. The question is, will we sell it? Will we miss it? Will we just give up on it? What did Esau do? He was a bit hungry, so he sells his birthright, the double portion, the inheritance, the blessing that the father placed upon Jacob. He he sells it to Jacob. And Jacob becomes a powerful nation that God uses mightily. You know, I've known people who have given up their inheritance, have given up their callings and someone else has taken it. I've seen it. And I don't know about you, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I've said many times before, and you've probably heard me say, I'm pretty sure someone else was meant to plant Miles Hill Church. They just never did. And so we got to be part of it instead. Second best, but that's okay. (laughs) Why has God placed us into these families? Why has God placed us where he's put us? Because he wants to give us and fill us and empower us to make a difference to those around us. Hebrews, right at the middle of Hebrews, Hebrews 12. Verse 12. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. 
Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness. This is a challenging word. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many became defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears." What a sad, sad situation. A man that on a fleeting moment gives up everything that God had for him and he could never get it back. You know, this happened to the nation of Israel time and time again. Do you know that God wanted his whole nation to be priests? God wanted the whole nation of Israel to intercede, to be close to him. He wanted the whole nation to gather around and worship him and be able to step into that holy place. But they chose to reject him. They chose to rebel against him. They made a golden calf instead. They worshipped the created things rather than the creator. And because of it, only the Levites were allowed to become priests. They gave up on an inheritance that they could have had. The closeness with God. You remember Elijah and Elisha? You remember the story? This guy Elisha, a young prophet, hanging out with Elijah, a seasoned prophet, knows his stuff, speaks of God, raises the dead, you know, does some amazing stuff. And Elijah desperately wants everything that God has for him. He runs after Elijah because he says to Elijah, hey, can I have a double portion of what you've got? Can I have a double portion of the spirit that you've got? He sees something on Elijah and he says, look, I want that a part of my life. Not because he was an egomaniac. I can tell you, if you look at Elisha's life, he was servant-hearted. He desperately loved the needs, the people around him and wanted to meet those needs. He was willing to give up reputation for God. And if you read the story, you will see that there's all these hundreds of other prophets, but they hang back. That they, they kind of want to learn from Elijah, but they don't want to get too close. But it's Elisha that gets close with Elijah. He builds a relationship with Elijah in such a way that when Elijah goes, he sees his cloak, he sees him disappear. And he receives that, that anointing, that empowering, that double portion of the Spirit of God. How many of us are sitting back in the sidelines? How many of us are kind of looking back and only want to get so far because to get too close looks too painful or might cost us too much? You know, we determine the relevance of our relationship with God. We determine that. You and I have a choice of how close we get to God. Draw near to God and he draws near to you. You and I determine the intimacy. You and I determine how close a relationship we get with the living Father, the Father of our family, the one in which we become sons and daughters of a king. And my encouragement is, don't be fearful of what God will do. Don't be so proud of your own life. Don't be so concerned about what others might think of you or how crazy that God might ask you to do something so out of this world. Draw close to God like Elisha did and see what inheritance he will give to you. See to it, verse 15, that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. You know what? You are the bride of Christ. And if you marry up, commit adultery with anything else, you're sexually immoral. See, he's not just talking about physical sex here he's talking about our hearts he's talking about our hearts that love God the most that love Jesus the most a bride a church that is willing and waiting that is holy pure spotless 
because Jesus is our everything. Let us not be like Esau and miss it. Let's not be so consumed by ourselves that we miss it. For you have not come, verse 18, to what may be touched, a blazing fire, a darkness and a gloom, a tempest and the sound of a trumpet, a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in feastal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What he's saying is, is that we may be burnt into earthly families in a particular time, some good, some bad, but in Jesus, we get born into a spiritual family. We become family to God and God to us. He becomes our father. Jesus becomes like our big brother. That we obtain an inheritance that is intrinsically linked to Christ. An inheritance that doesn't fade away, doesn't crumble, doesn't dissipate in the ether, but is purposeful and intentional to bring God's love to this world. What it says to us is that we get a portion. We can have a double, triple, quadruple portion of God's Spirit, but we don't only get that. We also get an inheritance that is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Did you see that in the Old Testament? They got a double portion and a kingdom. We in the new through Christ get a portion of His Spirit, but also a kingdom, a godly kingdom reigning by the King Jesus that is meant to infiltrate every sphere of our society in which we live. You were born and placed where you are for a significant purpose. You live where you live because God has a plan for you to reach to your neighbours. You work where you work because God has got a plan for you to touch the lives of the people or your colleagues that you work with on a daily basis. You go to that toddler group or to that social group because God wants you to show his kingdom of love to a world that is broken and bleeding, destroyed by sin. And yet, are we going to hand back in the wings and say, God, this isn't for me, I'm just too fearful, or I don't know, I think I'm okay just where I'm at. Are you really okay just where you're at? Are you really? Is there not more for you? Is there not more for you? Not because it feeds some insecurity in you, but because it will save a dead, lost world. Colossians. (laughs) Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. The first born Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, were thrones or dominion or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus the one who made a way through the cross to bring us into his family, adopted into the family of God, grafted into the vine of God, is the head and he loves to pour out his inheritance on his people, his brothers, his sisters, the ones who will walk alongside him. Galatians 3, what it says in Galatians I'm going to stand up for my back. Galatians 3, 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, 
The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God. Remember that the inheritance came through by the male heir. So whether you're male or female, you become a son of God. For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. We clothe him on ourselves. It's like putting on a big overcoat. We put it on Jesus so that Jesus is seen, not us. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor male nor nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, as according to that promise. What was the promise of Abraham? Pardon? That the nations would be blessed. I found myself praying in our prayer meeting this morning, a prayer that God gave me when I was a kid, literally, probably Ethan's age. And I remember God said to me, he showed this net across my room and I saw an invisible net and God said he was going to make me a fisher's man. And as I was praying to him, he said, if you ask me of the nations, I will give it to you. Why? Because I am a son of God. And so are you. We can ask for the nations and it is ours because God's intention for his people was always to bless them, to be a blessing. You were placed in your human physical families to bless them, even those that don't know you or don't even like you. How are you to act and respond around them? You may be brothers or sisters, you may be mothers or fathers. You, I don't know where you sit in your family unit, but the way in which you bring Jesus Christ to that family will impact them. Yes. You know, this, this stuff that we talk about, this Jesus who gave it all, He gives it to us. Not for us to keep to ourselves, but to give away. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. I mean that the heir, as long as he has a child, is no different from a slave. <laughs> Though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers and the date, the, the date set by the Father in the same way. We also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, just caught up in the world, living in sin, just lost, helpless, still a son of God, but don't even know it. An inheritance that is unmatched. You cannot even imagine the inheritance and yet we didn't even know it. Waiting for us, sat there in the bank, ready for us to draw it down. But when the fullness of time had come, in another place it says the culmination of the ages, when the right time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts where we cry, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Wow. So many of us still wander around like orphans, lost, helpless, just scraping through life. So many of us looking at other people saying, you know, but God blesses them, He doesn't bless me. And we're so caught up in everything other than Him. And so we miss it. We've got to get our eyes off each other. We've got to get our eyes off we think God's dealt us a good or a bad hand. We've got to stop complaining and grumbling and just get our eyes fixed on Jesus. Ephesians. The epistles are just full of this, this truth. Blessed be the God, verse 3, of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He doesn't even mince his words at the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians. He basically says, do you not understand? You're blessed to be a blessing. You're blessed in every spiritual blessing. There is no lack in the kingdom of God. There is no lack in his church. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before he even knew that you knew that your parents even knew you would come into existence, God had a plan. 
holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Do you know there's not a living soul on this world that God hasn't predestined, hasn't desired, hasn't wanted, hasn't died for, that cannot become a son? There's not a single person that is exempt from that cross. If only they receive Jesus' life and give him their old. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished, poured out upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven heaven and things on earth. Jesus' first coming did it all, church. How many times have I said this? He paid for it all. He provided for it all. He gave it all. We live in the blessing of the inheritance of God, the reign of His kingdom. God's kingdom cannot be shaken. It's not a kingdom that should be hidden under a basket or under a table, but it should be set up high so that it shines out into the life in which God has placed us in. In Him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory in him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit it becomes a stamp on us we belong to Christ we're his sons Jesus is our big brother we're set in this incredible family who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. What he's saying to us is there. Are you going to go and take it? You've got the stamp on you. If you have received Jesus' life and given your life to him, you are a son, a son and daughter of the king. It's ready there for us to take. ready for us to take Romans last one Romans 8 so then brothers this is verse 12 we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided... We suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. And maybe that's where it hits the problem. Are we willing to be persecuted, ridiculed, our names trashed for the sake of Jesus? Are we willing to give up all reputation? Are we willing to allow the cross to be applied to our life so that sin no longer reigns in our mortal bodies, but we walk by the power of the Spirit? this incredible truth that we are brothers with Christ, co-heirs, the Bible says. Do you know what that means? That means we can do nothing apart from him. It's a little bit like having a bank account with two, two, uh, two signees and you need two signatures to draw down the money. That's what it's like. You need Jesus's and you need ours. He's so humbled himself that he has brought us into his great plan part of his incredible family so that we are co-heirs that it requires both of us to bring the kingdom can you believe that that God chooses us to be a vital part of this kingdom blessing that without us it cannot happen because it requires both of us both Christ and us in partnership together 
There is no inheritance apart from Christ. There is no life apart from Christ. There's no kingdom blessings apart from Christ. We cannot live in this reality apart from Christ. We were talking in our connect group about this idea of carrying our cross. What does it mean to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? What does it mean to bear the cross, to hold on to that cross? And you know what? I think so many of us are so afraid of it that we fight against it. That we think, man, this is going to cost us too much. And do you know what? Because of that, the cross is so much heavier. The wooden cross turns into an iron cross, Spurgeon said. He said, because we're just fighting against the will of God and we think we know better and we're afraid of what it might cost us or what it might look to us, we fight against this cross and the weight of this cross bears down upon us like an iron cross. And yet... If we submit to the will of God, if we submit to the cross of Christ, we realise that he carries it. What did he say, Jesus said? My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Why do we find it so hard? Why are we so bogged down? Because we're trying to do it. Because we're trying to fight against God. We haven't truly believed that we've been grafted into this family and that we need to work in tandem with Jesus. We're too afraid to let go and let God have his way in our lives. And yet, you know what? When we do, the light of his gospel raises us up. That we begin to shine in the darkness of this world. And Jesus becomes so much more glorified because he is our greatest desire. I want to encourage us this morning to be willing to pick up the cross, to bear it, to say to ourselves that sin is dead. I shall no longer live in it. Instead, I will live by the power and the anointing and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. See, if Jesus was our big brother, he would come alongside us and he would say, hey, Dave, I've done it all. Why are you trying to fix it when I've already fixed it? Why are you trying to buy stuff with your own effort when I've given every provision? Why are you worrying or scared? Because I am with you. I will never leave you. If Jesus was our big brother, we would stand there and we would be overwhelmed by his love and his provision. And the truth is, he is. And it's not asking him to show us. It's asking him to allow us to see it. Too many prayers are about, come on God, show yourself to me. Come on God, do this for me. Do you know my prayer more more than anything else is, God, help me see what you have done and what you are doing so that I may walk in that. And that should be our prayer. He's continually speaking to you. He's continually leading you. He's continually providing for you. He's continually showing us who we are in Him. We just need to see it so that we can let go and walk in it. You've been set in your family groups. You've been set in your workplaces. You've been set where you are for a purpose and a plan. And God has given you His kingdom. Let's use it for his glory. May the glory of God cover the earth like the waters cover the sea because he has a people, a church, a bunch of kids that are willing to say yes to him. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your grace to us your love that is poured out on us. Lord God, we thank you that, that God, we were lost and dead and helpless, corpses in the ground, and you came and you breathed life into us and have set us on our feet and you walk with us and you fill us and you provide and you give all that we need. Lord, I ask this prayer for all of us this morning that you will help us to see who you are, how great your love is for us, who you have called us to be, and therefore what you have asked us to do so we may honour you with all of our lives. And Lord, I ask for anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, that they will see you too, just 
who you are in your raw love for them. Amen. Amen. Amen.